morning, well people. Are you well? You're the well people. I just want to take a minute to welcome everybody here and everybody who's online watching this morning. Welcome. We hope the Holy Spirit invades your space as I know he's going to invade this space this morning. I also want to take a minute to recognize the importance of today. Today is Palm Sunday. Woo! If you have a hand, you have a palm. We love this week. This is going to be an amazing week. It's a very important week on the church calendar. And so I do want to um, just make sure that we're, we're reflecting on, on Jesus this morning. That is why we're here, right? That it was this day in history that he started the beginning of the end in the beginning. The whole reason why we're here is because of what he did on the cross for us, which of course we will be hearing more about next Sunday. Um, but I do want to take a moment, if you guys would just say hi to the people next to you. Welcome someone new, if you see a new face, because there are some out there. elements up here to stage left if at any time during worship you feel like partaking please do so we also have a very free house of worship that if you want to come up front and express yourself that's also welcome and really the biggest um, desire of our hearts is that you would experience the presence of God in the way that he speaks to you that you would enter in and worship the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, this morning. So let's worship. All right, we are excited to worship this morning. Feel free to come up to the front if you'd like. And let's sing, There's No Shadow. There is no shadow that has ever overcome your life. There is no rival that has ever overcome your might. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won, we've already won. There is no weapon that has ever left a mark on you, and there is no army with the power to conquer truth. You've always been with us, every battle you've already won, you've already won. Show me, show me. Show me a mountain he can move. He's the God of the breakthrough and anything is possible. Show me one thing that's too hard. Show me waters he can't part. He's the God of the breakthrough and anything is possible. Oh, it's possible. There is a kingdom that's advancing at the speed of life. And in his kingdom, every dead thing is bound to rise. Oh, God, our redeemer. 
declare this song all the angels and all the angels cry holy is the lord god and all the earth replies holy are you
face down and we worship, we all cry out, you are worthy, God, you are worthy, God, we crown you, fall face down and we worship, we all cry out, you are worthy. upon himself all our guilt and shame hanging on the cross for the world he loves with his precious blood he purchased
For the heart of heaven 
There's something about just being completely open before the Lord, allowing him to search your heart. He's the only one that can save. He's the only one that can deliver. He's the only one that can heal. And he's come to do that. He's come to give us life abundantly. So Jesus, we just ask you to come this morning to search our hearts, to pour out your love in a way we've never experienced before. Thank you for the deep, deep love. Thank you for your deep, deep love. I hold nothing back. I hold no part of me back. I'm open to your love. Oh, I'm open to your love.
I give you my worship and all of my passion. I give you my hope and all my
such a sweetness in the room I really feel like um, people are opening up pl places in their heart that maybe are new or fresh and if you want healing for your heart if you are aware this morning God's put his hand on something in your life you know I was thinking of like the fear of abandonment trauma, those are kind of hot topic words in our culture, but if there's a tender place in your heart that you are aware you've opened up to the Lord this morning, I want you to raise your hand, because I, I believe the Lord wants to heal you. His love doesn't come to just comfort you and make you feel better, it comes to transform us. And you know, the occult, they, they endue physical things with spiritual power, it's part of the the practice of darkness but in the kingdom we are physical things endued with spiritual power we are the temple of the living God so if someone has their hand up and you're near them I want you to just put your hand on their shoulder I don't want you to ask them what's going on I just want you to pray for the love of God to touch their heart This is less about our words and more about his presence. We're just agreeing that he is in the room. And he is showing people his love. Thank you, Jesus. thank you that you are able to fix things that we didn't even know were broken. You're able to put things back in place that we didn't know we were missing. You're able to rewrite memories. So Lord, we thank you for your presence, your grace this morning to, to transform our pain, that you give us beauty for ashes. Lord, I pray that everyone being prayed for, if you're online and you're with friends, put, put hands on your friends, put your hand on your heart. I pray that everyone encountering this, this time this morning would be transformed by the love of God in a supernatural way. In Jesus' name. I heard 
um, I heard friends of ours have a, they have a daughter, Brian and Mary Kate, uh, had a daughter months ago that is pretty sick right now, and it's, it's serious, so if you would just agree with me, we're going to pray for Marigold, is her name, we're going to pray for her healing. So Lord, right now as a community, we just lift up Marigold to you. Lord, we lift her up and we ask that your, your presence, your grace, your healing power would touch her life. Lord, we rebuke the powers of the enemy that would come to steal, kill, and destroy. We say you have no hold on this beautiful daughter's life. Lord, the marigold would be a witness and a testimony of your glory for decades and decades to come. Lord, we lift up Brian and Mary Kate. We ask for your peace, for your, even your joy to touch their hearts in Jesus' name, that you would bless that family, the sisters, Lord, that that whole home would be full of peace. Jesus name. Amen. Thank you for praying with me for that. Uh, we're going to receive our offering. If you would like to sow into what God is doing here, there's a bunch of ways to give. If you're online, there's a text to give on the website. There is a QR code up behind me and our ushers will be around with baskets shortly. Um, I was thinking in worship, I'm just so, so weird that God Let's our temporal money turn into an eternal testimony. It's so good of him. I, you know, I'm picturing, I don't know what it's like in heaven to store up treasures where moth and rust do not destroy. But I'm putting stuff in eternity that's going to stay there forever. And uh, so that's what we get to do this morning. So if you would like to do that, you guys are released to give. Ushers, please start passing the baskets. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. Amen. Hey, good morning, well family. I have, uh, oh, thank you. I didn't really expect, you know, you to respond, but I appreciate it. <laughs> I have a few announcements for us. Um, next week, as you all are aware, unless you're not, it is Easter Sunday next Sunday, and it's going to be an extra special, exciting Sunday for us as a community. Not only do we get to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we also will have Dr. Leon Van Ruyen in the house. Yes, we love him. It's also going to be our commissioning service for pastors Matthew and Rachel. So that's going to be amazing. Yes, it will. We, so it is going to be a Sunday that you're going to want to be in the house. I'm just saying it for so many reasons. So fight every temptation that hits you next Sunday morning to not come. That's it's going to be my word right there. Okay, so... Uh, also, we have coming up in June, our youth camp, which, yes, this will be our third year going down. Yes. Fourth? Oh, lordy. Time is flying. So our fourth trip, our brave, I do say brave, uh, leaders pack up a van or two and drive to Texas with our youth. And it's an amazing time. It is one of those getting there is half the fun, I think is probably true. Um, but they have an amazing time there. And, and I do believe the trip is also a very significant part of that. So if you're interested in learning more, please connect with Josh or Becca Howard. Um, there is a $50 deposit to reserve your spot. So you might want to start thinking about that as well. It does fill up. Um, so be in prayer about that. And lastly, starting April 10th, we are going to learn, if you don't know how already, we're going to learn how to pray like Jesus. It's, yes, it's going to be a three-week Cultivate series in which we are going to learn um, through the Randy Clark Ministry School uh, prayer model, and it is a model, um, but it's an awesome one, and it's really rooted in Scripture, and it's going to be an amazing time. 
we do encourage everyone to get there. It's going to start at 6.30 at night, and we do ask that you register just so our instructors know how many people to expect. And if they're preparing materials, that would be awesome. So that's it for the announcements. And it's okay if you clap at the end. It's fine. because I know. Thank you. We are all happy that they're over. So if you would take a moment to stand and honor the man that's going to bring the word, Pastor Matthew. Good morning, everybody. How are we all doing today? I am doing great. Thank you for asking. I want to give a just a second plug. I really want to encourage, uh, especially the leaders, if you're a VSD or a ministry leader here at the church, to attend that Cultivate on April 10th. It's really a, a prayer model that we followed as a community for years and years and years. We went to... Um, Oh, what, what was it called? The VOA, Voice of the Apostles, down in Orlando, I think was the first experience that we had. Not the first experience of Randy Clark, but the first experience with the, the, his ministry in that way. And um, he just has, has just as, as Anti said, just through scripture, just put together just such a beautiful prayer model of praying for the sick. It's praying like Jesus, right? The model isn't what heals, but Jesus does heal. And when we do things like him, good stuff happens. And that's, that's what I, I really want to just encourage the leaders here to, to attend that, and everybody to attend, but especially the VSDs and ministry leaders, if you would. Um, I am uh, really excited, but first off, what the heck? How about worship this morning? Oh my gosh, that was amazing. It was a beautiful time. There's this, uh, this little girl that was up front, oh my gosh, just transforming the atmosphere of this room through her worship. That's what I experienced, at least. It was Beautiful to see. I really believe that there's a, a, a calling upon your life to shift atmospheres. Where are you? If you could, if you're in here, so could you? All right. She's getting water. She got tired from worshiping so hard. She needed a drink. Well, I just, I just, just believe that there is a calling on her life to change atmospheres. That that girl, when she walks into rooms, that there's things that are going to shift. Uh, in workplaces as she gets older, in homes, and I'm just excited to see what it is that God does through her life. We just say yes. She can, we can repeat it. We, she can repeat it. I'll, I'll tell her after service the same thing. It's okay. She's thirsty. She needs to take, she needs a little break after that. All right. Well, I am, uh, I'm excited to, to bring this message this morning. Um, for those of you that know, I mean, You've been coming for a while. We've been in a, a quite the season of transition. You know, it's been six months or so that we are we're, we're making a transition where the the founder of this church, the senior leader, our apostle, my mother, is passing the baton from one generation to the next, and it's such a it's a beautiful picture to see. We were on a call, uh, we were talking on a call, like we just call each other all the time, so we were, we were talking on Friday, and uh, I'm so used to Zoom, where we're always on calls, you know, as since COVID, we, we're just on these calls all the time, and uh, anyway, I was talking to my mom on Friday, and I, I was thinking about this time of transition, and what at the core is actually taking place, and you know, as we were speaking, I'm like, man, this is discipleship in the purest form. This is what discipleship is actually meant to look like. It's not to get people to believe something different, but it's actually for one life to carry on the life of another, that, that we would actually be transformed into the image of Jesus through human-on-human -human interaction. And I, I was just saying just about how gracious and gracefully you've gone through this this time of transition and and you know behind the scenes it could be this could be a really difficult thing and it has been tough but for her to do it in humility the way that she has honestly like that deserves an applause it's It can be very easy to, in times of transition, to really let go of things that you truly care about, right? But we know that at the heart and soul of what Jesus did, he modeled it for us, that everything he has, he gave to us, and he told us to then go and to do. 
And this is a, a model of this, this baton being passed is such a, a beautiful picture of that. You know, God, he thinks in terms of generations. When he gives promises, they are generational promises. The kingdom is actually meant to continue to advance from one generation to the next. And, and in order for that to happen, it takes fathers and mothers being willing to give what they have to sons and daughters. You know, we can, we can look at this life and we can see it in, uh, in such a, uh, a short picture about what I get to accomplish in my life. And I need to make sure that I do everything that I need to do by the time that I die so that I feel successful. But when we live in the kingdom our mindset shifts and says, what can I actually give to this next generation so the kingdom continue to advance here on the earth even after I'm gone? It's actually meant to be fathers and mothers sowing seeds to the next generation. The next generation then, reaping fruit from the previous, sowing seeds down to the next generation. It's meant to continue to expand, to get bigger and bigger and bigger. We see this with Elijah and Elisha. Scripture says that, that as, after Elijah, he passed the mantle down. We know that Elijah did twice the amount of miracles that Elijah did in his life. He thinks in this generational mindset over and over again. Elijah and Elijah, Ruth and Naomi, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, Paul to Timothy, David to Solomon, Jesus to all of us. Like there is this mindset that is meant to continue on so that the kingdom doesn't have to get reset when one generation dies. We don't get a new Bible each generation with a new set of mandates, but we're actually meant to give what we have into the next. And, and this, this picture, it's, it's taking place on, on our leadership team, but I wanted to challenge all of us in our thinking about what we are focusing on in life. Like, am I trying to store up treasures and success for myself, or am I actually thinking generationally minded? What am I actually giving to my children's children? In Deuteronomy uh, chapter 7, verse 9, it says, One generation, I'm sorry, this is uh, Psalm 145, verse 4. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Deuteronomy 7, 9, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. The faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. When I, uh, when I first got saved, I was maybe, or no, this was a little after, actually. I had my daughter in the back of my car, my uh, Abigail, my oldest. It was just her and I, we were driving through my hometown, Dubuque, Iowa. We were back there visiting uh, family, and I think I was just, I think we went just to show, just to show her off, like, hey, look at I got a baby now, and uh, we were in the back of the car, or she was in the back of the car, and I was driving down um, kind of our version of the Beltline in, in my hometown, it's called the Arterial, and, uh, and we were, I was driving down the road, and I'm, I'm on fire for God, I'm just thinking, I'm blasting worship music, and praying, thinking about all the great and mighty things that I'm going to do for God. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to see revival. I want to see this. I want to see that. I want to see your kingdom come. All great and virtuous prayers. But then the Lord said back to me, but yes, I'm so glad you want to see that. But what are you putting into motion? And it started this mindset shift in me where I quit thinking about only what I get to accomplish, but what am I actually putting into motion here in my lifetime that gets to be passed on to my children's 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 children? What are the things that, that get easier as my bloodline continues? What are those, those things that were normal in my family history that get to stop with me? What are those addictions that came through and then they stopped once they hit me? What is the, what is the brokenness that gets to stop with me that, I get to, that they get to learn is just the expectation of normal life that they get to grow up in? It's such a beautiful picture, us raising our children in this kind of environment and getting to see that for them, this is normal to experience the presence of God on a Sunday like this. Maybe it wasn't normal for us in our upbringing, but it gets to be normal for the next generation, whether that's natural children or spiritual children that you get to bring into the kingdom of heaven. My, um, my intention this morning 
is I'm actually going to do, we're going to take a little look back through time. We're going to have some story time together is what we're going to do. What, as I was praying about this message, earlier this, this past week, I had felt the Lord give me five kind of main themes that he has really birthed through our founder, through, through, through my mother, here in this house. And, and what my intention is, is just like when Joshua and the Israelites crossed over the Jordan, they, the Lord commanded him to build this, this area, these stones of remembrance, so that future generations, when they passed by, could remember the provision and the miraculous works that the Lord did in their life. And so that is my intention this morning, is that we're going we're gonna to take a little look back through our history to honor what it is that the Lord has done through your life, to honor as stones of remembrance, as not just a, a pile to walk by, but as a foundation of that this house is being built on. You know, we've, we've been using this term of, of passing the baton quite a bit. And in a relay race, when a baton is about to be passed from one runner to the next runner, that runner that's waiting for the baton is, is, is very mindful of the pace at which the runner before them is running. They, they keep their eyes upon that runner that is behind them, watching so that when they get close enough, they actually, as they take off, the goal is for them to match the pace of the previous runner so that the race does not slow down but can continue going forward. And so this is my intention this morning is that we're looking back and we are catching the pace at which we have been running as a community so that as this baton is passed, we continue on the same pace in the same race. Look, when this baton's passed, we're not heading for another track. We're going to continue doing what the Lord has birthed in this house. I am committed to that. We are not going to go and switch courses here. We are going to continue on in these foundational truths that the Lord did. And though the, this leg of, of our pastor's race is done, she's not done running yet. It's just a new leg to this race that's coming. And so we get to celebrate her as she goes into this next season. We get to celebrate this promotion that the Lord is doing in her life. And we get to keep on running. All right, so there were, um, as I said, there were kind of five main areas that I want to talk about. Five pillars, if you will, of, of emphasis that the Lord has done through our community since the very beginning. And the first one that I'm going to be talking about is, is why we all love worship the way that we do. It's what we just experienced. It's the priority of his presence. You know, when I was, um, I think I was probably seven, eight years old, maybe nine, I don't know, eight through 12. I could have been 17 for all I know. Uh, <laughs> when I was a child, um, I remember I would come and I would visit and and uh, at that point, we were living in different states, my mom and I. And, and I would come, and as I'd wake up in the morning, I'd walk up from the basement hungry, ready for breakfast. And I remember walking into, up onto the first floor, and there she'd be just worshiping Jesus. Worship music blasted, probably why it woke me up, honestly. Worship music blasting. And I just felt that there was something different up there that was going on. That at that time, I couldn't put words to it. I didn't understand necessarily what it was, but now I know that there was this hunger and desire for the presence of God to be experienced above all else. And then as I uh, grew older and I got saved when I was about, I was 19 years old, it was during the Lakeland Revival. How many of you remember the Lakeland Revival? Anybody? There's a few, few of us here. So the Lakeland Revival took place down in uh, Lakeland, Florida, and uh, that was a helpful name to know. The word. Um, and at that time, it was when uh, God TV had started doing live stream. That was like cutting edge. This was 2009. Live stream was not a normal thing. God TV is, is broadcasting this revival of, of Lake that was taking place in Lakeland, and it had an international impact where millions and millions of people got saved, millions of people got delivered, got healed. Whether you were in the service or not, God was still setting people free. He happens to not be bound by distance. And uh, I, I remember right when I got saved, we would do this thing. It was Todd Bentley was the, the, the 
gentleman that was used during that time for the Lakeland Revival, and he called it pickling in the presence. And we would literally just lay out. It was like a nightly routine. It was like dinner, and then instead of dessert, we pickled. And, uh, <laughs> and we would just literally lay on the floor and just wait. Worship and wait for God's presence to come into our home and to overwhelm us, to overtake us, to, to cleanse us, to do the thing that Max was just talking about, to search our hearts, to, to heal those deep places that were in our hearts. And from the very beginning, this has been a heart cry of hers, and it's a heart cry of this community, and it's something that we will continue moving forward. And you've heard her say it many times, that if the presence of God is not here, we are closing the door. I am continuing that promise as we go into this transition next week. We will not move forward without his presence, because we don't want to be doing anything that he's not doing. And his, his presence, it's not just a feeling, it's not just an emotion, it's not just a worship experience. We can, it's, it's something that can take place during the word, it's something that takes place during fellowship. It's like this first time that we get to encounter what reality actually is, is the only way I can explain it. It's his presence, this thing that can't be put into words, it's just we know that there's something more, there's something more real than what we are living in. Right now, this is what the presence of God does. It draws us up into a greater reality. Mark chapter 16, verse 20. After it says, and they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. The beauty, the difference between our religion and every other religion on the earth is that our God is alive. And he proves it over and over and over and over again. It's a relationship with a risen king, one that is actually transforming this earth to look like heaven. And we get to partake of that as we honor his presence. We put a priority on it above all else. So we were, this was maybe a couple years later, and um, we we decided the well, for those of you that don't know, I'm sure many know the story, and I, and I understand that I'm going to be repeating things, but I, I do think it's important for us to look back to align ourselves all together as a community with this transition, to align ourselves in what it is that we are actually building, to make sure that we are falling, that we are continuing on in the race that God has set before us. So it was 2012. We just wanted to worship the king. And there was five of us, I believe, six, no, the first night, maybe six or seven. It was a big blowout service. Six or seven of us in uh, the living room of my mother's home. And at that time, we were just going to start doing a monthly Bible study. And you guys good with story time this morning? <laughs> All right. And uh, we're doing a Bible study. And then at the end of it, there was prayer and, and, it, and his presence came. And because his presence came, everybody said, can we, can we do this more often? Because we don't get to experience this all the time in our lives. And she said, sure, why not? You guys can come back. And I think it was, at that point it was, why don't you come back next month? And then at that service, or gathering, I should say, um, we, we pulled Rachel's keyboard out. And, uh, whew, still there, still out. And we just worshiped. We worship the king, knowing that the presence of God is the ultimate priority for anything that we are building. We did not intend to start out to build a church in the traditional sense of what a, of what a church is. We just want to worship. And it's why you see in our services oftentimes we don't, we don't really put too much a priority on pleasing what church should be. <laughs> We're okay with moving on and, and doing things the way that God would have us do in the moment to, to actually extend worship at times. You've all been here in these services that it's like, man, what is happening? We don't know either, okay? I'm just going to put it out there. None of us know. <laughs> and, and we started worshiping, and as a result of worshiping, people we just started coming more and more, and, and Max and Thea 
started coming, and Spencer and Kaylee, who I know are, I think are serving in the uh, children's ministry today, and Jake and Nikki, and, and Renee was there at that time, and Di had visited the house when, when we were just hanging out at the house, a bunch of people worshiping together, and I'm sorry if I miss anybody else that's in here, but this was 12 years ago of, of people that are just hungry to see God's presence move, not just here, though. But to see his presence move in their homes, to see his presence move at, at Meyer. I've been in Michigan long enough. Maybe it's Myers now. Is it Myers? Uh, to see his presence move at Meyer, at, 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 uh, in people's um, schools, wherever it is that the presence of God would remain the priority of our lives, not of our services, but of our lives. And then the second thing that, I, that, that really was a real hunger in why we began meeting and pouring into people's lives, the thing that, that really was burning in my mother's heart was a heart for discipleship. So the presence of God is a priority, and the second to being a heart for people to be discipled. You know, for, for many years, she was an itinerant minister, was, was traveling around quite a bit, going to these services, and... Um, you know, be these conferences that she would speak at. And she always used to turn that she got tired of blowing in, blowing up, and blowing out. And not actually getting to be a part of seeing the transformation that takes place in people's lives. And I've, I've witnessed personally in my life what this heart of discipleship can actually do. How much being believed in. <sighs> this is going to be a teary one. Can I get a box up here, actually, somebody? <laughs> of what this uh, heart of discipleship can do. To be believed in even when you shouldn't be. Like, not according to your sophistication or your behavior or education, but to actually be believed in that God will use anybody. And to put that into practice, the amount of opportunity that she willingly has given out to many of us here in this community over and over and over and over again, even when we fail, still more opportunity. I remember one time I had preached this message, and at the end I'm like screaming, like, God is going to come, and he's going to strike down with a rod of iron. I like started quoting Revelation at the end for some reason. I, what happened was I watched this guy, what was his name? Oh, I watched this preacher, and I was like, I could do that. And, and I, Paul Washer. <laughs> yeah. I, I became Paul Washer in the moment. And um, <laughs> fortunately, it didn't record. Uh, I don't know if it got deleted or <laughs> if it really didn't record. I'm sure, it got deleted. Um, but I was invited to preach again. Like, we can screw up and continue going forward, and that's what the heart of discipleship is. It's like, I know that you're not perfect, but I'm going to give you what I have anyway, whether you deserve it or not. One of the greatest moments of my entire life is the result of that heart that you have carried. Besides getting saved, married, having children, the next on the list is preaching in Flint. Like, this was at a time, and many maybe don't know this actually, but during that season when this, this, this took place, is my mom was, was praying about starting to travel again and was asking the Lord if doors would open up, that if, if she should go and start getting back into some itinerant ministry again. And this door of opportunity opened up. During the time, the very thing that she wanted to do this door of opportunity opened up. And instead of just taking it, she asked the Lord what to do. It felt like it was for me to go and to preach and to minister at this, this uh, event that was taking place in Flint and to bring the rest of the team, just us young. I, how long ago was that? Six, seven years ago. Yeah. And did you go? So, yeah, it was wild. It was one of the wildest experiences of my life. And we went to this, it, it turned out to be at like this community center. And I don't even remember the exact message that I preached. But at the very end of it, I just asked for the team to come up and start giving words of knowledge. And 
in that service, I watched before my eyes somebody that had cataracts. Fog, their entire eyeballs were fogged over from cataracts. I'm doing the number thing in front of their face. They cannot tell me what number I'm holding up in front of their face. And um, I watched the fog completely disappear from their eyes. As this is happening, I see out of the corner of my eyes somebody jump out of a wheelchair and start walking around the room. As that is happening, I see somebody else in a wheelchair. I don't know if it was at the wheelchairs in this place, but somebody else is in a wheelchair going down like this. They had broken their back, hit by a car, I believe, and all of a sudden were down touching their toes. This is in like 10 seconds. The Holy Spirit just broke out. Also, as this is happening, a fight is breaking out in Flint style in the back of the room. Like... <laughs> This is the type of the environment that we were in at this time. By far the highlight of one of the greatest highlights of my life. And it all stems down to a, a, to a heart, a desire for disciples to be raised up and for them to walk in kingdom power. For others to actually take what it is that, that we have been given and to place it into another generation to see them move. And it's at the core and in the DNA of what this house has been built on from the very beginning. And that will not change. The third thing is a heart for the hurting. Luke uh, chapter 5 verse 31 and 32 says, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. So we started and we continued the you know, meeting and gathering in her home and, in, and we ended up, it started to be too many people for the living room and we, we finished out the basement. And uh, for whatever reason, we just attracted these like post-church people. And what I mean by that is people that were burned out, like done with organized religion, done with church. And... For, and at the very heart and core of what it is that, that, that she felt was that we were called to both the unchurched and the post church to see those that have been hurt by religion. And it's, trust me, guys, it's not the easiest group of people to be ministering to. Like, it's not necessarily the thing you want to search for. But it's the people that Jesus is searching after. And I'm sorry for those that are the post church people that, yes, you weren't that easy. I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> Look in the mirror. That's who I'm talking about. <laughs> and, um, but there's always been this heart for those that are hurt, both emotionally and physically. It's why we make place for healing to take place in our services over and over again. It's why at the end of the services, we call people up that if they need healing for anything at all, and we mean anything, not just physical, but emotional healing, it's in the DNA of what we're doing. It's part of our mission to heal and restore. It's a heart for the hurting that actually drives us forward. I think it's Matthew chapter 9 maybe that says, Jesus moved with compassion, then went and healed. And it's in the DNA of who we are that we would actually be a compassionate people that understand that, look, life is messy. And we're not just trying to do this to create a bunch of plastic Christians that put a smile on their face every Sunday, but real authentic relationships would actually take place in here. For people to really live in vulnerability with one another because it's only through vulnerability that we can come to terms with the places in our heart that really need to be transformed and that really need to be healed. And so we, we continued on in the basement for, oh man, I don't know how long, maybe a year or so. And it, it just started to outgrow. We, we had people donate chairs that they had bought at Costco, those folding chairs. They're in my basement right now, currently. And... Uh, and it was just, it was such a beautiful thing that was taking place. A bunch of people that were just broken and hungry to see the king glorified. That's it. It's a simple, simple, simple way of life. A simple mission, a simple focus that will continue and will remain. As we're looking back at what happened here, as we're catching the baton all together as a community, this isn't just a, a me and Rachel thing. This is a community transition that we are going through. And so my intention, as I said, is to align all of our hearts around what it is that God was doing so that we don't just start straying away in our thinking of, of, oh, maybe now it's time to do this, maybe now it's time to do this. No, we are building on the foundation that was laid here at this church. 
Oh, another thing that I learned uh, through this process with a heart for the hurting is just your humility to like you're never too sophisticated, you're never too old, you're never too arrived to go and seek after healing for yourself. Yeah. It's probably been one of the number one things that Rachel and I talk about and that we admire about you is your ability, no matter what is, has happened to you, no matter what situation is going on, first you look in the mirror and say, is this something in my heart that needs to change? I've witnessed it. I've been a part of those conversations over and over and over again. As there's, if there's a relationship thing that's taken place, whatever it is that's happening, I've watched you time and time again take responsibility for your own healing. And that's something that we all as a community could learn from, the where if there's a situation taking place in life, it's so easy as society to point and blame others. But look, we need to be responsible for our own hearts. We are responsible to actually take care of this garden within us and to not allow the hurts just to stay there and to fester. One of the things that, that you said over and over again is, look, I will not be a leader that is hurting because I know hurting people hurt people. And it's such a model, not only in a sense of leadership, but just in life and in relationships with one another. Like, you will bleed out upon those that you are doing life with. Hopefully they're gracious enough to understand that it's just blood from a wound and they'll help you patch it. But at the same time, you need to be responsible for your own bleeding. Like, we have to constantly be aware be able to come before the Lord. It's, it's moments like this in the service. It's, it's at home. It's in the morning when we, when we wake up and we just we get silent before God and we just do a little heart check about where we are. It's such a beautiful picture. The uh, fourth thing that I learned or that this was really founded upon was a hunger for revival. So back in... The early nine, mid '90s is when when Pastor Kathy came to the Lord, and and uh, it was during the Toronto blessing that was taking place at that time, and that's where Randy Clark's ministry really grew a lot of of recognition. The the gentleman that I was talking about with the the healing prayer model, and it was a beautiful uh, outpouring that was really rooted and grounded in the Father's love. It was, uh, it was people were understanding, maybe for the first time, maybe it was just an emphasis at that time. I don't know. I wasn't around then. I was alive, but I wasn't walking with the Lord at that time. But there was a heavy emphasis that the Father is not just somebody that's up there waiting for you to screw up, but he actually loves you. But not only loves you, he enjoys being around you. Like he wants to be with his people. He didn't, he didn't sacrifice his son to be mad at you. <laughs> he sacrificed his son to live in, in pleasure with you, to bring us back to this garden reality that we would actually walk and talk with him like, like, the, like what happened with Adam and Eve in the garden. It's this beautiful picture. And so at that time, though, the church that she got saved into was in revival. And full circle moment, it was actually Dr. Leon was the one that the Lord had used in that community, the, the man that is coming here next week to, to commission all of us into this new season. He was, in, he was the, the main catalyst, kind of all throughout southern Illinois, and I believe there's some regions around as well, that um, the Lord was just really breaking out in revival in. And when we receive something from fathers and mothers, that just becomes our new expectation of living. Like, when my children are growing up in a home that's filled with love, that's just their expectation of what the home is supposed to be like for their children. When my children are growing up in a home of abuse, that, that becomes the expectation of what's, what they are going to raise their children in unless the Lord intervenes and does a change. When you get saved into revival, it just becomes the expectation of what church is supposed to look like. And so at the very heart and at the very core of everything that we are doing here at this church, everything that we are doing here within this community, it is a hunger for the church to be revived, to be awakened, for Jesus to be seen, for religion to die, for it to be slaughtered away once and for all, and for King Jesus to be the only thing that matters. And so we, we outgrew this, this basement space, and then we, we moved into a, a shared space. Uh, I'm sorry, I should have told you waterproof makeup today. I am so sorry. I hope you don't have anything afterwards. Um, 
But we moved into the uh, a shared space. There was another church in town that allowed us to uh, rent their facility. And by rent, I think we paid them like 20 bucks or something. Like, <laughs> I don't even know if we paid them. I don't even remember. It wasn't much. There was just a, such a gracious pastor that was leading that community and just wanted his, honestly, he wanted his space to be filled with people like us, is what he said. He wanted their, uh, when they weren't meeting, he wanted it to have that sort of presence in the room, knowing that we were fully charismatic. It was not a charismatic church, uh, but, but he wanted that in that place. And so it was such a beautiful thing, and that's where we got to meet uh, Melanie and Godfrey as a result of going in that space. But the community just continued to grow in a hunger for revival. Like every message, I think, probably during that time was all about revival. That's all we talked about. And it's still at the core of what we believe. But revival isn't just, like I said earlier with the presence, it's not just a service experience. It's families transformed. It's businesses that actually reflect the core values of heaven. It's it's, it's transformation of anything that we are doing in our life. It is reflecting the picture of what heaven is. You know, when she first moved here, before, before she moved here, uh, she had this vision of a fire in the palm of a hand. I know she shared that in her message a few weeks ago, but I want to reiterate it. It was a fire in the palm of, of, of a hand. And having moved from Illinois, not knowing that Michigan is the mitten state. Is this the right way? I don't even know. Is this it? Okay. Thank you. Is this Detroit over here? Area? Down here? All right. Um, so is this the Myers right here? <laughs> um, it's all Myers. This is Myers. <laughs> and DeVos. All right. Um, so <laughs> where was I going? <laughs> Revival. I do this all the time. What will I do when you're gone, Mom? How will you keep me on track? Um, fire in the hand. There we go. And so coming here, it was seeing this image of a revival that is taking place. And, and uh, having moved here, started realizing that people are like, oh, I live up here. I live over here. I live here. And asked, what are you doing? And, and that was the first time she had realized that it was the mitten. And this vision that she had had would come in kind of full circle in that moment. I believe that much of that vision has actually been accomplished because revival is not a service experience. There have been families that have been restored. There have been families that have been transformed. There have been businesses that have been birthed out of this community that have a single desire to reflect Jesus here upon the earth. There have been healings that have taken place. There have been dead that have been raised as a result of this community. There has been cancer healed. We have seen people in our services get out of wheelchairs. We have, I've heard of people out in the, in the marketplace that have been prayed for by people from the well. These crazy people that will not allow Jesus to be contained to a building. Over and over again, testimony after testimony after testimony of the miraculous provision that Jesus has given this house. We have gone through so much together as a community. We went through a flood together and the provision was there. That is revival that is taking place here on the earth. It is another kingdom invading the kingdom of this world. That we get to live and breathe and have our being in this, this different reality. Not just individually, but as a beautiful community. So this hunger of, for revival that's burning within this community will continue, will remain. We will continue going forward until this entire world looks like heaven. There is nothing that is going to stop us. And whether it's in this generation, the next generation, the next generation, it does not matter. It is what we are putting into motion, though. It's what the Lord had started and birthed through you and what we will continue going forth in as a community. And the last one that I felt like. So the priority of his presence, a desire for discipleship, a heart for the hurting, a hunger for revival. And the last thing is that we do it all as family. Now, family is at the core and at the DNA of, of what Jesus had modeled. And it becomes such a, the, it's the most, 
in this nation, for sure, it's the number one thing under attack. With all the identity crisis that is going on, with sexuality and things, it is what is under attack. With fatherlessness in homes, family is under attack because the devil knows that a family together is dangerous to the kingdom of darkness. And to do things as family, it actually means that as, as you model, as the book that you wrote, that we live shame-free before one another. To live in family puts a demand on us to actually live vulnerably before one another. There have been so many weeks. We have a kind of a tradition where we do the Sunday after church um, hangout. There have been weeks upon weeks upon weeks. I don't want to do it, honestly. I am tired. I want to go home. I don't want to do anything but go to sleep. I just got done. At, sometimes I'd be worshiping. I'd hop down here, come back around. i come up and preach. I don't want to do it. But with this heart for family that you have carried, it puts a demand that I don't get to own, just do what I want to do. I don't get to hide. I don't get to just fall away and try to get uh, and do this thing on my own. We are called into family with one another to be interdependent on one another because the kingdom advances as family. The old African proverb says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go as family. And we just saw how generationally the Lord is thinking. And that actually has to look like something practically. Like we can't just say, oh, I believe that the kingdom of God is a family and he wants to, he wants to move generation, generationally. That's messy. Yeah. Like family is not an easy thing for so many people, especially if you were raised in, in some sort of brokenness in your family. But we get to rewrite what it looks like to live in healthy family with one another. I think it was last Sunday, we were talking about how many people are in here that have these generations within one church. I'm seeing it right now with Greg and Kim and Max and Thea and the stands, the whole generation. They take up a row or two or three or something. And we have the Howards that are in here. All of these people that are, there's this generational thing, the, the Wimbushes, that, that is happening within families in this community. And it's something that is beautiful. It's not something that is easy but it is necessary. If we actually believe that Jesus has called us into family with one another, it doesn't mean then that we get to just get away from our family. We get to divorce our family, so to speak, when things aren't going the way that we want them to go. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that we get to run and we get to hide. It means that we stick together. We push through those hard conversations. The things that are making us uncomfortable, we stick together. We go through those moments. And it's something that you have modeled so beautifully here at, as a community. It's, it's times when, you know, you, you said this maybe five, six years ago, but it was during a real difficult season of, of her life, and it was it said, she said, the, it wasn't my faith that got me through it. It was the faith of my family. Family allows there to be a safety net for us. That when we don't have anything to give, when we have nothing to show up with, family's like, you know what, that's all right, I got the mashed potatoes this year. Not a big deal. I'll take care of it for you. That's at the heart and core of what we are trying to build here, that you don't have to have it all together at all times. You won't. And if you try to, you'll burn yourself out or you will just be really fake. <laughs> That's when we're faking disciples, not making disciples. Like we have, to be, we have to be honest about what we are feeling in our hearts and just show up. Stick together through thick and thin. It doesn't matter. We have been through the ringer in this community just through situations that just did not happen at the right time. You know, globally, the church, we watched a lot of our family members in this community that left during COVID and unfortunately didn't come back. And that, that saddens my heart. I believe that there will still be a time of restoration for many of them. But 40% of the church globally left. And um, then right after that, we had the flood of this sanctuary. For those that weren't around during that time, this entire place was raining inside. And... We had to meet across the street in the school, come back and meet down in the basement once they were able to put the floor back on. And uh, man, it was, it was something. But it was family that kept those of us together that are still here. It was the commitment to something bigger than ourselves. Commitment to not just to comfort, but to the uncomforts that family means for one another. So we went from the basement 
We went from the living room to the basement, to the church, the Methodist church, to the strip. We were in a strip on Breton and, or, yeah, Burton, Breton and 44th Street for a while. And then here to this house where we are right now. It's been quite the journey that we've been on together as a community. And, uh, but I just wanted to realign us to what it was that the Lord started here. That not just me and Rachel or the leadership team, but that we would all look back as a community and align ourselves to what it is that the Lord has started so that we can catch pace with where it is that we are going. Because I am committing to you. Rachel, the rest of the leadership team, we will not build on something else except for these foundational truths. So as we go forward, as the baton is passed next week, I'm committing that we will continue in healing, restoring, training, sending, believing the best in one another, and seeing Jesus get glorified. And for that, all I got to say is thank you. We love you. And I'm so grateful that uh, this next stage is a celebration. That's a really good message. I forgot I was supposed to close until right now. Uh, if you're new, <laughs> and honestly, if you're new, welcome. You know, this isn't the only place that God is moving, but it is definitely a place that God is moving. Yeah. And uh, you're welcomed into what you just heard this morning. There is a seat at the table for you, if you want it. The best decision of my life was getting born again. The second one was marrying Thea. And the third one was plant, planting here with Apostle Kathy and saying yes to covenant. I love you so much. So uh, if you want to get to know us, there's a welcome thing over by the stairs. And uh, <laughs> ministry team, if you guys would come up. Jesus is here. He wants to heal you. He wants to heal your heart. He is wildly in love with you and present to do miracles in your life to show you who he is if you'll open up to him so please take advantage of the ministry team um, I just pray that that this I don't even feel like I need to pray this is going to continue I'm so thankful to be a part of the kingdom of God so Lord we thank you for this morning we ask that you would just continue to be glorified in each of our lives in Jesus name amen you guys are released have a great week